Enon, thank you so much for joining us today for, for this interview from your phenomenal offices that, that are just jam-packed with toys. We really appreciate you having us here. Thank you, Julia. It's great to finally have you here. Yes, great to be here in person. Now, I want to talk about the evolution that you have led um, of Mattel just in the past several years and this new path that the company is on. But first, I just want to talk about some of the macro issues that so many different leaders are focused on right now across industries. We just got these new inflation numbers this morning. I know there's a big question about whether the, the country is going to be going into a recession and the impact on consumer spending. I know you have your earnings next Thursday, so you're in a quiet period. But speaking broadly, what are you seeing right now? Well, like all companies, we are following closely developments at the macroeconomic level. As a company, we have been working through inflation for several quarters now, and we're factoring into our planning. The uh, company is flexible, and we design an organization that is able to um, face uh, challenging economic conditions. Now, of course, in addition to consumer spending, another issue you have to reckon with is supply chain constraints, um, which you managed last year. But I'm just curious, as you think about shipping all of these objects all around the world and getting them into consumers' hands, how optimistic are you that this year that the key holiday season is going to be um, better in, term in terms of some of the supply chain issues? Well, as we said before, supply chain is now one of our core strengths. It's a competitive advantage for Mattel. And we've been able to navigate through supply chain issues uh, for two years now. And it's not that we have not been impacted, but we've been able to work through these issues and achieve a record growth year for Mattel in 2021. And supply chain was a key factor of, uh, of, of that success. Well, I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more in your earnings next week. But just to return to the evolution that you have led of Mattel, you became CEO in 2018. And since then, you led a full turnaround of the company, which you said you completed in 2021. And now you're in this next phase. Just to take a step back, when you started the company, you were the fourth CEO in four years. There had been a huge amount of turnover. What was the opportunity you saw as someone who came from the entertainment industry, Maker Studios, Entomol, what was the opportunity you saw in, in taking on the role? First, you accepted the role of chairman, then the role of CEO of this company. Well, I always admired Mattel uh, from afar as the owner of one of the strongest portfolios of children and family entertainment franchises in the world. And I, I was attracted by the quality of, of the assets that the company owns, by the capabilities Yes, it went through a period of decline, but I believe we can turn it around. And the, the thesis was fix the core toy business, knowing that if we can do that well, there is tremendous opportunity to grow on the toy side. And on top of it, if we are able to capture the full value of our intellectual properties, that can be transformative. So walk us through how you approached that restructuring process that began in 2018 and ended in 2021. I mean, you wanted to streamline it, focus on the toys, but what did you have to do to get the company there? Well, the fundamental change was to change the company from being a manufacturing company that was making items into an IP company that manages franchises. And that's been a pretty comprehensive change operationally, culturally, how we think about our, our product and, our, uh, and, and how we engage and connect with consumers. And in the course of those four years, we took our EBITDA from 126 to over a billion dollars. And um, with that, we reached, uh, and we took also our leverage ratio down from 25 times debt to EBITDA to 2.6 times in Q4 of last year. And in the first quarter of 2022, it was down to 2.4. So we dramatically improve and strengthen our balance sheet and position the company for growth that we are now uh, believe we are entering an exciting phase of. Yeah, and before we get to this growth phase now, um, I'm really curious about how you approach this idea of streamlining the business. You cut your workforce, but you also reduced the number of items you produced. How did you figure out where it made sense to cut back on those SKUs, as they're called? Yeah, we, we made significant changes in the way we operate. We reduce our workforce by more than a third globally, in the, not in the manufacturing side. On the manufacturing side, we uh, exited five factories and focused on, on, the more, on the productive items we were making. About 35% of uh, the, the items we were making were not productive, and we cut that long tail and focused on the more productive, profitable items that we manufactured and with that, we improved um, uh, our profits dramatically. 
And so is that effectively about reducing the number of items in each category? So you had fewer Barbies or fewer Hot Wheels, or is it about eliminating categories entirely? It was mostly uh, 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 broad horizontal optimizations or optimization of the items we were making. So we did cut across all categories. And we're focusing on, the more, on, on, on items that were more profitable, more in demand, that have a, high, a higher growth potential. And that focus was fundamental in how we simplified the way we operate. So you focus on the items that are actually productive and, and, and profit generating. And so it seems like you must have had to use a lot of very precise data to understand exactly what was working and what wasn't. Um, tell us about what you called the Mattel playbook to really um, strip out some of the, the distractions and focus on the key brands. Yeah, the Mattel playbook speaks to how we manage our franchises. It's about cultural relevance, design-led innovation, executional excellence, and a very clear brand purpose that we infuse in each and every one of our product. And that was really important to, to connect with consumers whereby each, each of our product, each of our brands and franchises has a reason to be. Beyond being a toy, of course, we're now making play systems, but when people, parents, families, consumers engage with our product, there is an, a, a, a purpose, a, a clear purpose that elevates the uh, play system and gives pe and give people a, an exciting reason to engage with our product. And so give us an example of that. What do you mean by a play system? I mean, many of us may have these, these toys in our homes, but what do you mean by a play system? And how did you figure out how, what, how to give a brand purpose or what purpose might be appropriate for, for which brand? Take Barbie as one example, obviously a headline um, uh, franchise for Mattel. Barbie, Barbie's purpose is to inspire the limitless potential in every girl. The Barbie play system is not just the doll, it's also the, the Barbie dream house, it's a camper, it's an entire experience, a holistic experience of how we reach and engage with consumers. Toys um, is not just a form of play. Uh, toys are things that consumers hug, they touch, they go to bed with them, and the emotional connection with the consumer is very high. And, and if you successfully establish that relationship, then you can grow the brand and extend it into other verticals, which is exactly the journey we're on. As a company, we also defined a very clear mission, which is to create innovative products and experiences that inspire, entertain, and develop children through play. And if we do that well, and make sure that each of our product does that, we're ahead of the game. And this is what really established Mattel and put it on such a growth trajectory. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the um, focus on the entertainment industry. Obviously, there's been a huge amount of attention on the Barbie movie that's in production. But just to revert back to what you were saying about the brand itself um, and the way you've been evolving the Barbie brand. You know, for many years, people said the Barbie brand was not good for little girls because it, it gave little girls who played with the toys a false image of what they should aspire to. And you've really worked to change that um, by taking so many inspirational characters and also adding to the diversity of the, of the dolls themselves. Tell me about how you've been approaching that process, which seems to be a, a priority. At least walking around here, you see a lot of examples of that. Of course. As a company, our goal is to contribute to a more diverse, equitable, inclusive, and sustainable future. And this is what we infuse in all of our brands. Barbie is ahead of uh, the curve, really the flag carrier for diversity and inclusivity. And the approach is to really represent the way the world, the, the, uh, in the way children see it. It's about, and when we talk about cultural relevance, is about being current, being timely, as much as Barbie is timeless. And that combination and how you create and, and embody that, uh, or represent that, uh, those values into the product, is really a combination of art and science, but it's something that is a core competence for Mattel. If you look at how we, we, we bring culture into our brands, whether it's Barbie, also Hot Wheels, or Uno, uh, it's all around everything we do, is making our product, brands, and play systems current and relevant to today's consumers. And this is really about taking brands that have been around for, in the case of Barbie, 63 years, Hot Wheels has been around for 52 years. Thomas has been around for more than 75 Thomas years. Thomas the Tank Engine. You're Thomas on a, the you're on a first name basis with Thomas. Yeah. Thomas the Tank there, Engine. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it's how do you take these heritage brands that have such a strong connection with consumers 
a built-in fan base, in some cases going back two and even three generations, and make it relevant to today's consumers. And our ability to do that so well has been a key part of our success. Yeah, and we've seen, I see Barbies all around your offices here, um, a very diverse range of dolls, but then also dolls that um, are, are the doll version of a lot of um, inspirational women in particular, um, which I know has been a big part of that strategy. Um, so as you focus on building out these brands, talk to us about the importance of entertainment. You start off the conversation talking about IP. Your background is in entertainment, and now you are investing so much in film, television, games. Um, explain to us the overall strategy, and I want to dig in more into the movie business. Yeah. As the owner of one of the strongest portfolios of children and family entertainment franchises in the world, we have a tremendous opportunity to capture significant value outside of the toy aisle. This is not instead uh, of what we're doing on the toy side of the business. This is in addition to all of our success on the toy side of, of the company. And when you talk about capturing value from RIP, think about content, licensing and merchandise, uh, including consumer product, as well as digital games and digital experiences. On the content side, it's about films, television, and, and there alone. These are big verticals that um, in success can be very transformative. The opportunity is not to create content in order to sell more toys. This will happen. But the opportunity is really to, particip to participate in these verticals and build accretive businesses in these areas that are in some cases are actually bigger than the toy industry. And in today's world, everyone is looking for big franchises, big IP that rise above the noise level. And it's about a built-in relationship with consumers, high awareness, and clear brand representation that defines a story. We have never done it as a company. We've never released a major movie, uh, theatrically. We, uh, when we did television shows, it was more with the orientation of, of marketing and promotion of our toys. Today, our movies, our television content is about building accretive verticals. And the approach is to make great quality content that people want to watch. This is our mandate to our creative teams and the money to, and, and the relationship that we, um, that we develop with creative talent around the world. What I think is so interesting, though, is that you're talking about making the content. You're not talking about licensing these brands. There are plenty of big, iconic brands that license. In the same way that Jurassic World licenses its toy rights to you, you could license your rights and just you know, sell the rights to a, to a film studio. Why is it so important for you to be and your company to be so closely involved in the actual production of this content? Well, it's, it's a hybrid approach. We, we do partner with creative talent. Uh, in fact, the best, we believe, creative talent in some, of, in some cases, in most cases, these are the, the leaders of, of the industry, to collaborate with us and imagine uh, our brands and transpose it to the big screen or, the, uh, or television screens. In the case of Barbie, um, as, which is currently in production, about to finish principal photography, we partnered with Warner Brothers, but obviously uh, brought in uh, top creative talent, uh, Greta Gerwig to write, together with Noah Baumbach, and for Greta to direct the movie. Uh, Greta is one of the most prolific filmmakers of our time. And it's very exciting to have her on board and really put together what she and uh, how she envisages uh, Barbie uh, and translate it or, 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 or communicate with, with the next generation with her vision. And of course, uh, Margot Robbie, who um, uh, is a co-producer uh, co or producer on this movie and our partner, um, um, and Ryan Gosling, Will Farrell, Simo Lu, uh, America Ferreira, such top uh, talent, uh, we could not be more excited about this, uh, the way the movie is coming together. Yeah. Right now, we've been showing some stills from the movie that have set off a firestorm of interest. Um, this new concept of Barbie core fashion, um, as people have been so excited to, to get a peek at this movie that's coming out next summer. But what I think is so interesting about the choices you made with this Barbie movie is that you're clearly not making a movie that's just for the little girls who play with the toys. Yes, you have collectors of the toys, but this idea of you're not making 
this movie for a very young child audience. You have sophisticated filmmakers who make movies for adults, um, and it seems based at least on the costumes and the approach, like you're gonna have fun with this. You're gonna allow Barbie to sort of, to laugh and, and, and have a sense of humor about some of that iconography. And so I'm curious um, how that plays into the whole vision. If you were just making the movie to sell toys, maybe you'd just be marking a movie uh, marketing a movie to four and five year old girls, but instead you're really thinking about this as reaching a very different kind of audience, including adults. Well, Barbie is very much more than a toy and more than a doll. Bar Barbie is a cultural icon, a, a pop icon. And this movie is really shaping up to be what we believe, you know, will become a societal moment. It's going to be a cultural event. And the way Greta, uh, is creating this work of art uh, with this incredible talent and the, uh, the, and, and the approach that is very different, very unique, not something that you've seen before, uh, is going to be very exciting. But what's interesting is you're going to try to recreate this with many other properties. I mean, I believe you have 19 films in production. Is that right? Well, we currently have, uh, we've announced uh, 14 movies in development, including the Barbie movie. Mm -hmm. And yes, we do collaborate and partner with innovators, with creative filmmakers. And much like I said earlier, the, the request, the partnership, the basis of this relationship is about, please make great quality content that people want to watch. Yeah. This is the, uh, this is the uh, relationship. Don't try to sell toys. We know that in success, if people watch the movie and there's high engagement, good things will happen. We know how to sell toys, but the opportunity is really about quality entertainment based on our IP. And so another piece of the quality entertainment strategy here is games. You have mobile games, um, which you're making uh, through your own division, and then you have the licensing of traditional uh, to, to console games. And then you also have Roblox, where you have two Mattel worlds within Roblox. Lay out how the strategy here um, uh, sort of establishes the groundwork for more expansion into that space. Yeah, the, the opportunity around video games or, or games in general, digital experiences, is to, is to, is to really b leverage the relationship we have with consumers. This area is fast growing, and we all know the amount of time that children spend in front of screens. As the owner of the underlying IP, we have the opportunity to reach, engage, connect uh, with consumers wherever they are. And we know that children and consumers in general, even older consumers, do engage with our product, and the opportunity for us is to do it um, through licensed, uh, licensing arrangements, being a first-party publisher on Mattel 163, which is, a, is our mobile game studio, where we focus mm -hmm. on the mobile games, as well as uh, children-oriented uh, platforms such as Roblox, with two games in uh, Hot Wheels and Masters of the Universe that we already uh, published. So significant opportunity there. Uh, and looking forward at what, you know, this conversation about the metaverse, I know that you've been doing NFTs um, and the Roblox, you know, worlds are part of that metaverse conversation. But how do you see the NFT business growing and perhaps intersecting with some of your metaverse investments? Well, the, uh, the two key features of the of NFTs in general is collectability and community. And in our case, we have uh, brands that really play on, on those planes uh, very successfully. Um, Barbie, Hot Wheels uh, have huge uh, collector uh, market that is still untapped, and we believe we, be, we can be very successful there. Uh, and of course, the community, the built-in fan base uh, is very vibrant, and we know how people are engaged with our key brands. We've had three NFT uh, campaigns that were not uh, very large. They were more, uh, you know, early stage, and for us to really test the market, and our product got, or our NFTs got sold almost instantly. Uh, and again, different types, different genres, um, and it's been very successful. So we know there's high engagement with our brands, and the opportunity to translate that relationship into the metaverse and the digital sphere is very exciting. Well, certainly so many opportunities as you move these iconic brands um, and intellectual property into film, entertainment, games, now um, NFTs in the metaverse as well. We are very curious to see what comes next. Elon Kreis, thank you so much for joining us today from Mattel headquarters. Thank you, Julia. It's been great. Thank you.